Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be invited to give uh, the first talk in this showcase event. Um, I'd like to thank you, Professor Kana, <laughs> Kana Garaja. I was rehearsing it, but not enough <laughs> for the nice introduction. Um, also, um, Professor Kate Robson Brown for the kind invitation. It was really nice to get, and I was really happy that I was able to fit it in my schedule. Um, and it's really nice to be back here in Bristol after such a long time. Um, also, I'd like to thank Liz Green and Patricia Holly for uh, helping arrange my trip and, and too many to and fro emails making sure everything went smoothly. Um, it's also a great pleasure um, to meet uh, Professor Jean Golden. Um, I'd heard about her, of course, and I was reading some... Uh, uh, some biography of her today, and I thought it was actually not inappropriate that I was here because many years ago I worked as a as a, a biostatistician at the Medical Research Council in Cape Town, and I actually worked with um, some pediatricians. And one of the very first papers I worked on was on predicting uh, perinatal mortality um, using gestational age and other factors. And of course, I was the data scientist on the project, the data skivvy, you know, um, back then we didn't call it data scientist, but that's what I was. So anyway, it's a, a really great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so, by the way, for those who haven't been there, this is Sequoia Hall at Stanford University, which is, is my home department. Um, and that tree is a sequoia, and you notice the dent in the roof. They're hoping the tree's going to get big enough so it actually falls in there. Um, so this talk is about um, supervised learning, um, which are techniques for building models from data and to predict an outcome using a collection of input features. So it's a, it's a fairly focused task. And I think we're all familiar with this, this, with this, this project and this task. Um, there are some powerful and exciting tools. Deep learning is one of the newest ones, but there's lots of them out there. Um, and they're not magic, we should be skeptical. So they require good data and, and proper internal validation. Um, human judgment and ingenuity are, are needed for their success. So what's changed with, with big data is model fitting takes longer, right? When the more data you have, the longer it takes to fit models. And, you know, this might, this may uh, test our patients and uh, and lead us to just jump at the first model that we come across. Um, it's also difficult to look at big data. Um, you know, you can't make plots that easily. There's tons of variables, um, and the data may be contaminated, and, and we not, might not be able to see that. So careful subsampling can help with both of these. So big, big, data, so big data comes with its problems. Some definitions. So machine learning, we've all heard that phrase, um, constructs algorithms that can learn from data. It's about algorithms, machine learning. Statistical learning, which is a phrase Tib Sharani and I coined, um, we think of it as a branch of applied statistics that emerged in response to machine learning, emphasizing statistical models and, and the assessment of uncertainty, which are usually um, or typically ignored in, in the machine learning community. And now the new term data science is the extraction of knowledge from data using ideas from mathematics, statistics, machine learning, computer science, and engineering. And they're all very similar, but with slightly different emphases. And of course, the big wine from statisticians is that this is just applied statistics again, perhaps on steroids, because the data is much bigger, the machines are much more powerful. But it sure feels like applied statistics. So, you know, it used to be that we used to sort of keep it quiet about being a statistician. When you get on an airplane and someone asks you what you do, you say, I work with computers, you know, because statisticians were considered even more boring than accountants. But it's changed, you know. So in 2009, this is a quote from Hal Varian, who's the chief economist at Google. I keep saying that the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statisticians, and I'm not kidding. So that's a quote. I know the grammar is not perfectly correct. My son pointed that out to me. 
But as you know, English was expect, exported across the Atlantic and it got a little bit garbled by the time it got to the US. In, in 2012, um, here was a quote from the Harvard's, Harvard Business Review, data scientists, the sexiest job of the 21st century. So things have really changed and are looking up for statisticians. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, this is our little moment of uh, in time. <laughs> so, in case you don't know, that's my colleague Rob Tipsharani, who I've done a lot of work with over the years. Okay, so supervised learning. So the supervised learning paradigm is probably best described with this kind of flowchart. You've got a huge batch of training data. You have some learning algorithm, often a black box. Um, it, it fits a model. And then the idea is you get the, the data has inputs and outputs. The, the model, uh, the learning algorithm uses those to fit a prediction model. And then you come along with a new input and you want to predict the output. The model makes a prediction and gives you a best guess of, of the output. Right? So it's a simple little story. Doesn't always very work, work very well. Like, for example, the predictions for the World Cup outcomes have all gone um, askew. Hopefully, not to, uh, hopefully um, today there will be a good outcome for, for England. So traditional statistics, um, domain experts work for 10 years to learn good features. They bring the statistician a small, clean data set. Today's approach, we start with a large data set with many features and use a machine learning algorithm to find the good ones. So that's a huge change. Right? The machine's doing more of the work, the human's less involved. So one of our big emphases is internal model validation. So it's really important. Don't trust me or anyone who says they have a wonderful machine learning algorithm unless you see the result of careful internal validation. Okay, so for example, divide the data into to parts A and B, run the algorithm or the, the, the model on part A, and then test it on part B. Okay, if it works in part B, you have some confidence in it. So, I mean, that sounds simple and obvious, um, but is it done uh, properly in practice? Rarely. People inadvertently cheat in this process without meaning to. They'll use all the data to, to filter the features beforehand and end up with a biased data set. And there's lots of other subtle ways of, of, of doing it incorrectly. So in God, we trust all others bring data. So that's a statistical proverb sometimes attributed to Ed, W. Edwards Deming. Okay, big data vary in shape. And the word big data is used to describe both shapes. So we've got wide data. So this is when you have measurements on many thousands or maybe millions of variables. So we have, um, in genomics, we have GWAS, right? We've got measurements of, of several million SNPs on each subject, and maybe not that many subjects. You have a few thousand or, or maybe tens of thousands, but the number of variables is much more. In document modeling, we have measurements on, on how many unigrams or bigrams that occur in a document it can get feature set of 20,000 or, or, or 20,000 squared and not that many documents. So these are wide data called for special methods. So some of the methods are screening, univariate screening um, and false discovery rate, FDR, lasso for variable selection, SVMs have a place there and stepwise selection and model fitting is prone to overfitting, and so we need to regularize heavily in order to not overfit the data. More observations, more, more variables and observations. And tall data is the opposite. We've got many, many observations, maybe millions of, of samples, and maybe tens or hundreds of variables. So we're data rich in, in terms of the number of observations, and it's more diff it's, 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 you're not so prone to overfitting. And so now we can afford to fit richer models with high orders of interactions. And so that that's, takes us to models like deep learning and boosting and random forests and so on. We can really wring structure out of the data 
And machine learning has really introduced statisticians to lots of nice, rich approaches, which we, we've happily adopted in, in our field. And then, of course, you've got tall and wide data. So these, these just give big headaches, right? You've got thousands or millions of variables, and you've also got millions and maybe billions of samples. Just to store the data is, is a huge job. Often, when data are big and wide like this, they sparse, right? So there's lots of zeros, so you can partially get around the storage problem, but they're still very big and, so they, and, and hard to deal with. So now we employ some, some tricks of the trade. So you try and exploit the sparsity. You use random projections to reduce the, the, the number of variables, hashing, um, variable screening, subsampling the rows. You can often build models or, or um, have models suggested by looking at a, a relatively smaller, a small subset of the, of the samples. Divide and recombine. Case control sampling, we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, map reduce, ADMM. So there's a lot of techniques that have grown in response to having just massive amounts of data and still the desire to fit models. And if all else fails and you want to work with big data, you join Google because they've managed to harness very large amounts of data and successfully learn impressive models. Okay, so I'm going to um, go through a few examples of, of big data learning problems. So here's an example. I did a search in a search engine for English tea, and you get some results. I've truncated it. And on the right, you get some sponsored ads for tea. So this is a, you, this, there's a big learning problem underneath this, and that's to learn click-through rate. So based on the search term that I just um, used, knowledge of this user, me in this case, my IP address and what they know about me, and the web page about to be served, what is the probability that each of the 30 candidate ads in an ad campaign would be clicked if placed in the sponsored linked location? Okay, so that's a, a common problem. So an ad exchange has a bunch of ads in a campaign that they, they, they wish to place on, 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 on web pages. They have to decide which ads to put on your web page when you click. And they're going to pick the ads that they predict have the highest probability of being clicked by you. Actually, by me, the probability is zero, I believe anyway, because I never click on them. But they still think there's some value in that. And, and so they were working with billions of training observations. As you can imagine, the outcome for training is clicked or not clicked based on many past examples. And the click-through rate's going to be something like 0.001%. Right? So very small number of clicks and mostly zeros. Right? And they've got to do this evaluation in less than 10 milliseconds because they then have to get into a bidding war with other ad exchanges and see who wins the chance to put the ads up there. So that's, that's a, a big, impressive learning problem. The other one is uh, recommender systems. You know? So I bought some... Um, some Dutch salty licorice. I gave a talk in Holland, so this slide came from there. Um, bought some salty licorice on Amazon, and, uh, and then it showed me some pickled herrings. So people who bought salty licorice tended to like pickled herrings. Actually, the Dutch told me they don't like pickled herrings. They eat them raw. So these are recommender systems, right? Um, based on my past experiences and those of others like me, what else would I choose? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Yes, some more. Um, modeling adverse drug interactions. So the US FDA requires physicians to send in adverse drug reports along with other patient information, including disease status and outcomes. So when drugs get approved by the FDA, they get, there's a whole approval process, but the drug's tested on its own. Right? both for safety and for efficacy, and if it passes the test and should, seems to show benefit, it can go on the market. But, of course, the drug's not tested in combination with other drugs patients might be taking, because that'd be too many different possibilities. 
But you can use these, these, patient, these, these doctors' reports that, that where they send in problems and they send in what all the medicines the patient's taking. It's a big enough database. You can find adverse interactions between combinations of drugs. So using natural language processing, these notes tend to be handwritten, messy notes. Stanford BMI researchers found drug interactions associated with good and bad outcomes. Social networks. Based on who my friends are on Facebook or, or LinkedIn, make recommendations for the, who else I should invite, predict which ads to show me. So there are more than 2 billion Facebook members and two orders of magnitude more connections. So knowledge about friends informs our knowledge about you. Graph modeling is a hot area of research. So um, Yuri Laskovich is, is a person at Stanford who I know quite well, and he, this is his area of research. So recently saw a really interesting talk um, which showed just how much they can learn about you just from knowledge of your friends. They can know relatively little about you. May, you may put very little about yourself on, say, your Facebook profile, but just based on who you know, you'll be amazed what people can predict about you. So the Netflix recommender, I'm pleased to see Netflix has reached the U England and the UK. It's, um, we've always liked it in, in America. And so that's where the, um, the, the, they use recommender systems as well. So based on the movies you've seen, and Netflix asks you to rate movies. So here's a movie that was given a rating of four out of five stars. And if you go along and rate the movies that you see, then Netflix will look at your ratings and they'll see how you overlap with other people who've seen movies that overlapped with the ones you've used and how they like them. And based on people like you, they'll recommend other movies for you to see. And Netflix set up a prize that ran from 2006 to 2009. To, um, it was a million dollar prize for the first team that could beat their recommender um, engine by 10% in root mean square error. It was a wonderful competition. They made this data set. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about the data set. A data set of 480,000 users and 18,000 movies with about 100 million ratings in all. So this is it, like a big matrix of users by movies. Some were, there were ratings, but of course most of them were missing because most users hadn't seen most movies, right? And your job was based on the ratings that were there to try and build a model for predicting the, the unseen ratings, right? And they gave, 99% uh, was missing, they gave a million dollar prize if you could beat this by 10%. Um, and so there were 41,000 teams participated over the course of the competition, which was incredible. And all over the world, um, we actually competed for a while, um, we were trying to do our modeling in R and had some trouble because the data set was a little bit big at the time. Now we could actually fit it in R. Um, the winner was at Belcor, called Belcor's Pragmatic Chaos. It was actually a team from, from AT&T Research Labs, which is where I used to work, not that I can claim any credit, and they won the prize, and a, a close second was the ensemble. They actually tied in terms of root mean square error and the team that got their final prediction in first was, was declared the winner. And there's a bit of bragging, because Lester Mackey was in the runner-up team, and he's a member of our department. So it was a great competition, fostered a lot of research. The winning teams, in some form or another, another all used ensembles of models, which means they took a whole lot of separate models and then combined them to get a, a, an ensemble um, prediction. And, and an important uh, ingredient was low rank factorization in the presence of missing data, which is essentially the singular value decomposition, also known in this area as uh, collaborative filtering. So that was a great competition. Um, it led to a lot of excitement, led to a lot of new research areas. OK, so some strategies um, for modeling big data. Um, if the data are sparse, lots of zeros or, or missing values, we can store using sparse matrix methods, and that makes a lot of analyses possible. So, for example, in the Netflix data, the missing values could be stored as, essentially as zeros, and you didn't have to store them, you just store the non-missing entries. 
I'm going to give an ex example next, Quantcast, which is a, a web advertising company. Um, I, was, I, I work on the advisory board there, and I was able to fit a sequence of logistic regression models using our package Glimnet in R with 54 million rows and 7 million features. These are document features. Well, actually, no, they're web page, page indicators. So extremely sparse X matrix was able to store it in memory, 256 gigabyte, and took two hours to fit uh, models of increasing complexity. So for me, that was the biggest model I've ever fit in R, and I was amazed that it was able to finish, but we were able to do it, but it also gives an idea of the scale. If not sparse, use distributed, um, maybe compressed databases. Many groups are developing fast algorithms um, to interface to such databases. Um, there's a company called H2O, um, um, and they have a package by the same name, H2O.ai, and they have a package on CRAN for R called H2O, um, which is an interface to R for highly compressed versions of, of data and Java-based implementations of many of the important um, modeling tools. So there's companies out there that are rising to the challenge of, of dealing with big data and fitting models, the ones we like to fit, on such big data. So this is a little bit about um, the, the, the Glimnet for fitting logistic regressions. So this is used on that big data set I just described. The outcome was binary. We fit a standard logistic regression model, but with many, many features. Um, and we want to do feature selection, so we use the lasso, which puts an L1 penalty on the coefficients. And so by now, lasso is fairly well known, introduced by my colleague Tip Shirani in 96. And the penalty, by shrinking, by putting a bound on the coefficients, it, it sets a lot of coefficients to zero in the solution. And we have an algorithm in Glimnet for fitting this, the, what we call the regularization path as you go through a series of values of the bound S from the completely unregularized on one end down to the other end where all the coefficients are zero. And then you need to use some validation data to select the model. So back to the Quantcast um, example. Um, so that big example I showed you, the data consists of each observation is a five minute internet session. And the binary target is type of family. Is, the family, is it a family with, with less than or equal to two adults and no children versus a family with adults plus children? And the purpose of this exercise is they don't, there's certain ads they don't want to show if there's a, probability, a high probability of a child being on, in a shared environment if there's a child being on, 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 in, on the computer. So seven million features of, of session information, the web page indicators and descriptors, and I divided the, the training set into 54, I, I got a training set of 54 million, a validation set of 5 million, and a, and a test set of 5 million. So in this case, all but a million, just over a million features could be screened because the others had less than three non-zero values. Right? So often when you get massive data like this and it's very sparse, even though you've got lots of observations, um, some of these variables are so sparse they've only got three non-zero values. So they're pretty much useless. Even three is questionable, but you just toss those out. So it gets down to a million features. So as I said, I, in, in this package we fit 100 models in two hours. That's down the regularization path. Um, and the richest model had 42,000 non-zero coefficients. I remember talking to Sir David Cox many years ago about fitting models on genomic scale um, where there were 20,000 variables. And he just shook his head and he said, you know, he doesn't know what applied statistics is coming to. You know. So I'm glad he's not here today. 42,000 would really have shocked him. And this model explained 10% of the deviance. And this plot I found rather interesting. This shows a misclassification error on the, the training, validation, and test set as we go down the right? And it's decreasing as the model gets richer and richer. And so you see several things here. 
even though the richest model had 42,000 coefficients, you can see the validation and test and training error are pretty much the same. So we're really not in a strongly overfitting situation yet, even though we fit in 42,000 coefficients. So that's kind of interesting. The other thing is that we far, you know, we, we're really far from finished in our modeling task. This is telling us that linear models are not rich enough and we could do better because everything's still going downhill, right? The other interesting thing that came from this analysis is that in the data was indicators of the hour of the day and the day of the week. And so here I've got a plot of, and so set up a series of dummy variables for all of those. So here's a plot of the coefficients for hour of the day, and, and each curve is the day of the week. And what you see, which is really interesting, is that on the weekends, so this is the probability that a child is, is with a family with children is on in this, this five-minute session. So you see, during the days of the week, from about just after uh, tw maybe around 12 o'clock, the probability of child increases because they come home from school. Right? But on the weekends, the parents don't let them get on the computer, or maybe they hog the computer, so the probability is lower. Except on Fridays, um, people come home early from work, on, sometimes on Fridays, and so that dipped down. So on, 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 on big data like this, you can measure sort of fine detail, which is sometimes interesting. H2O, actually also on the advisory board for H2O, and they, as I mentioned, fit impressive models. So this is one of their show-off slides, and it's, it's rather impressive. This is, this is a billion row uh, machine learning project, so there's a billion observation, and the number of features is, is, is not that huge, but there are three categorical features with cardinality 30, 376, and 380. So you've got a, a data set with about 700 features in all, and you fit in a GLM, a generalized linear model, logistic regression again, and these are the times taken to fit the model. It's 5.6 seconds, right? 14.2 seconds. So that's, that's impressive with such a large amount of data. Okay, so some strategies um, for modeling big data. Um, online stochastic alg learning algorithms are popular. Um, you need not keep the data in memory. Subsample if possible. So, when modeling click-through rate, as I mentioned, is typically one positive example per 10,000 negatives, right? So very small number of, of positive examples. You don't need all the negatives to fit, say, a logistic regression model, because beyond some point, maybe 10 or 15, um, the, all the variance comes from, from the small number of ones and not from having more zeros in the model. So you can subsample. So this is Will Fithian, who's one of my past students, and he has a very nice paper in the Annals of Statistics, Local Case Control sample, Sampling, Efficient Subsampling in Balanced Data Sets. Now that's something machine learning people actually didn't know about, right? And so they would sweat away with, with these huge amounts of zeros, and it's really not necessary when um, modeling logistic regressions. How much accuracy do you need? So timelines often play a role, as well as the ability to explore different approaches. And so explorations can be done on subsets of the data. So yes, that's a picture of Brad Efron, one of my colleagues. And we um, did this little experiment. Lots of people have done things like this. We had a largest data set. There were beer ratings. Um, there were 1.4 million ratings. Um, each rating was, was a little document. A These are German beers. So there was a little description of, of the beers and quality of the beer and so on. So it's a document. So we're using document methods. So there were three quarters of a million features. So these would be unigrams, bigrams, or trigrams of words in the document, typical representation of documents. Very wide, very sparse. Um, so using the same GlimNet package to fit the regression path took 70 minutes on this machine. Um, and what you see in here is, so the rating, at, actually it wasn't logistic regression, the rating was a continuous measurement, so it was just a, a, a regression model, linear regression model. So you see in 
relative mean squared test error on this axis, and this is model complexity. So there, there's nothing in the model, and then as we fit more and more, the red curve here is the performance of the model fit to all the data. So what we did is split the data into 25 parts, a very trivial way of, of distributing the computations. And now we could fit each of the models in about 30 seconds instead of 70 minutes, the whole path, on different, on different cores, and then average the results. Well, here's the performance of each of the 30, uh, 25 separate models. They all look somewhat similar, just sort of plotted. That's mean squared error. Of course, none of them do as well as the one fit on all the data. But then, if you just average the predictions from each of these, you get the blue curve. And it almost gets as low as, as the red curve, but you can do it much more quickly. Right? And you get a lot of other things for free now. You've got 25 independent predictions, so you can compute standard errors for the predictions, which is often missing in, in machine learning applications. You, can do, you get cross-validation for free and, and so on. So very simple things, but you can, you can get a lot of mileage. Okay, so a few more examples. Here's a, here's a, a project where um, random forest turned out to be really useful, predicting the pathogenicity of missense variants. So the goal here was to prioritize a list of candidate genes for prostate cancer and work with colleagues, uh, epidemiologists at, at Stanford. Um, Alice Whittemore was, was the lead, and uh, Weaver C was, a, was the first author on, on actually, no. Nina Ioannidis was the first author, but these were colleagues of mine. Um, and led to something called Ravel, a rare exome variant ensemble learner. So the idea was when there are mutations in the genome um, and, and when the proteins produce, the RNA will, the, the, will occur, the mutation will show up in, in one of the RNA molecules. And that, a missense variant is when the, pro the protein that gets um, coded for, the amino acid that gets coded for, is, is the unintended one. Right? So even though there's a mutation, you may still get a, a, a suitable amino acid. If not, it's called a missense variant. And sometimes that's going to be pathogenetic. So, and, and so there's many, there's many procedures for predicting the pathogenicity. Um, and we've taken 12 of them, some, you know, some of them, um, SIFT and MutePred. And the idea was to use a random forest to take these 12 scores that exist already and improve them by building an ensemble learner. So a very simple application. We have a um, training and, and test data set derived from different sources, um, reasonably large samples, a number of samples. And these are the features or existing scores that we're going to combine. And this is a correlation matrix. And red means strongly correlated, and blue means not correlated at all. You can see some of them are correlated, but some are not. If they're all strongly correlated, you're not going to get much by combining them. So you'd like them to be somewhat different. Um, anyway, for those who don't know what random forests are, they feed off decision trees. So decision, a decision tree learns a an algorithm in a very simple way by taking the input features and making splits on variables. And in this case, the first split was on, is SIFT bigger than 0.9? If yes, you go left, otherwise you go right. Then it queries another variable, is SLR bigger than 0.8? If, if yes, you go left, otherwise you go right. And eventually, you get down to a terminal node, and then in that terminal node, you estimate the probability of disease based on the observations that appear there. So this is a very simple model. It, it, it ostensibly builds interactions between the variables, so it, it can model interactions, but it's crude and doesn't work that very well on its own. Okay? Um, trees came out in the, in the, probably in the late 70s, early 80s. So shallow trees are too coarse, inaccurate, and deep trees, fine if you built a tree really deep, it's more accurate, but very noisy, high variance. So one of our um, data science heroes is Leo Bryman, and he introduced random forests, um, which is a way of combining many, many very deep trees and average them 
to uh, reduce the variance. And in order to get different trees, you grow them to perturbed versions of the data. So you randomly subsample the data, um, and so each of the trees are going to be different, and when you average them, the predictions are going to be different, the structure is going to be different. And now you get a test observation, you pass it down, say, each of a thousand trees, each one gives you a prediction of the probability, you average them. Okay? So that's what we used in this project, and it worked really well. So this picture is a bunch of ROC curves for analyzing the performance. So ROC trades off true positive rate with false positive rate. And you'd basically like to be up in the, as you change the, the threshold for the probabilities, um, you'll get a true positive or false positive rate. And you'd like to be up in the northwest corner here. And you can see that our method is right up in the northwest corner, higher than a lot of the other methods. Now, interestingly, these other methods are also ensemble methods that also take these existing scores and try to improve them. So you can see we did better. And of course, I wouldn't have shown you this picture if we didn't do better. So that's the method Ravel. And this is just another picture showing the performance. And even though it's a bit of a black box, random forest does give you a way of, of um, measuring the importance of features. And you get this kind of a scale plot that looks like this. And we see that bigger bars means better. And so two of, a handful of the scores were much stronger contributors than the others. OK, so I'll just close with very briefly with two newish methods. Um, one is Glintonet. It's a way of modeling two-factor interactions. So it's a way of extending lasso, um, which just selects variables in a linear model, to selecting variables and second-order interactions, intended for high-dimensional data. In fact, in this case, it was intended for GWAS data, with uh, selecting SNPs and interactions. And the other is GAMSL, which is also a way of using lasso methods for doing selection of additive models, both which variables to be in the model and how smooth, how, how rough the variable should be. Should they be linear, the terms be linear or nonlinear or there at all. This is Michael Lim, one of my past PhD students, and Alexander Choldakova, uh, which is also was a past student of, of Emmanuel Candice. So methods rather complicated, so I'm not going to dwell on it here, but modeling second-order interactions. Some of you will know what that's, that's about. Um, we use what's called an overlap group lasso to do that. The details, would, I wouldn't be able to get into them here, but it's basically a way of extending lasso to deal with this, um, this kind of setup. Um, in the GWAS search space, we we're actually searching a space of seven, over 700 million interactions. So you can imagine there had to be lots of tricks in that to be able to get into that space. And then, of course, even when you've selected, there's a really strong statistical problem of deciding if they're real or not. So anyway, so that's a package in R called Glintonet for doing that. And I, I don't want to use up all, too much time here. Um, we used it in a, in, in a paper with some colleagues in the medical school, Nigam Shah's lab, and we used it to discover three potential synergies um, using an OncoShare database um, from Stanford Hospital and Palo Alto Medical Foundation looking for synergistic effects between 296 drugs in breast cancer patients. So that paper is published, and they had a nice picture showing um, all the drugs all the drugs that were ended up being compared, and whenever there's a little link between drugs, there was an interaction found, and the, the thickness of the line shows the strength of the interaction, so now the job is to try and understand and interpret that. And then GAMSL, so that's generalized additive model selection. So additive models was one of the first things I ever worked on um, with Tib Shirani and and they've stayed alive largely due to uh, Simon Woodyear with his package MGCV, um, which I think the primary thing it does is for generalized additive models, and, uh, and it's very popular. So 
there's an additive model, there's a loss function, there's a response. And the idea is to put a penalty on the functions. These are functions of each of the variables. To put a penalty on the functions, and it's also using something called an overlap group lasso, um, and it's to enable state selection as well as degree of roughness, if nonlinear. So here's a particular variable, perhaps, and you'd like this model to automatically select if the variable is zero, shouldn't be in the model at all. If it's in the model, but maybe linear, and you can get away with a linear fit, or if it's nonlinear, but smooth, and how smooth should it be? Okay. And the idea is we want to let this model loose on a very large set of variables. And just like in Glimnet, where you have a regularization parameter, which is essentially knob, a knob, you're going to start off with everything zero. And as you relax the knob, you want some variables to pop in and, and adapt to the, to the suitable form for them. So that's the idea. So the package Gamsel um, does that. And, and so here's an example. Um, that I'm going to show you, and somehow it's, it's got itself started in the wrong place. So let me just get it back to the right place. There. So this is an example I'm going to show you. It's a small example. There's 12 variables. And what we see in blue is where the algorithm starts. In gray is the truth. So that's the true function. So it was a simulation, right? So the f in the first column, you see there's three variables, and the truth is linear. You see the linear, the gray linear? Yeah, you can see them. This one, it's gray and linear, but it's almost zero. And then the next three columns, the three variables are nonlinear. And then the final um, six columns, the truth is zero. And so we want to discover that automatically. So now I'm going to run the algorithm. You can see at, we had step one. Lambda is the penalty parameter for this regularization path. And it's at the, the value that makes everything zero. And if we let lambda get smaller, things are going to become non-zero. OK, so let's get going here. So you'll see the steps increasing. Lambda's getting smaller. Stuff's happening. Okay, so by step 30, it's done pretty well, right? It's found the two linear functions. Okay, by the way, I haven't shown you that the, the, the simulation had these as true functions and then plus noise, of course. There was noise in the model, so you're not seeing the noise. By step 30, it's got the two linear functions. This function, which was linear, it's still saying is zero, but it was almost zero anyway, so we're not too worried about that. The three nonlinear functions it's got, with a bit of bias, but you're always going to get a bit of bias. And at this point, the, the zeros are all still zeros. So it's done pretty well. But of course, it, it's an algorithm. It's going to carry on, right? So I just paused there, and you let it carry on. And of course, eventually, lambda's getting smaller. Eventually, everything is declared nonlinear. So now it's in the state of overfitting. It's at the end of the path. So now, of course, we'd use cross-validation to decide what value of lambda to use or have a validation data set to choose. And in this case, it actually picked, believe it or not, a value close to that optimal value, one, one step away from the optimal value, which is what you'd like. Okay? So an automatic method for, for, for figuring all this out. OK, so all the tools I described are implemented in R. I'm a big fan of R always have been. Um, it's wonderful free software that gets increasingly more powerful as it interfaces with other systems. Um, the R user conference last year in Brussels um, in July had over 1,100 in attendees. So the R community is growing and growing as the techniques get more and more powerful. And some cheap marketing. These are four books that uh, I've published with my colleagues. Tip on the first three, and, and Brad Efron's on the last one. Um, these books are all freely available. We make the PDF of the books free, so if you want to get access to these books, you can come to my website, and you can download the PDF. And with that, I thank you for your, for your attention.
we have some time for questions. We've got two roving mics, I think, heavy. Yeah, on either, one on either side. Uh, so would anybody like to kick off and ask Trevor a question? Uh, good afternoon. Steve Moyle from Oxford. Our mutual friend David Cox is uncomfortable at 20,000 parameters to fit. Are you ever uncomfortable? Oh, yes, for sure. Especially if you try and do inference, you know, with, with all the variables you've selected. But in the context of, of, of building prediction models, not really, you know. Um, you know, with document models, um, for example, and with wide data, and if the goal is prediction, even linear models are, are you know, overly complex, and so we can overfit easily with linear models. So using linear models in, in the predictive context there seems quite reasonable. And so we, the thing is we don't try and interpret the variables. Yes, Diva. Thank you very much for the talk. A typical trend from a non-statistician that statisticians tend to find a method or a model and then spend the rest of significant number of years, maybe the rest of their career, finding the problems that show the potentials of their model. So it's very much like finding a hammer and believing every problem is a nail. Do you have a concern, like being in the area for a while? Is that something you think academia should be concerned about, or is that the typical trend of how research should be? She was looking at me really hard when she said that. <laughs> you weren't referring to the generalized additive models that I'm still harboring on about. <laughs> well, I think there's always a risk of that, you know. Um, Leo Bryman always used to say, you know, when you've got a, a, a big hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, you know, I think for a good applied statistician, what's really important is that you learn a lot of the tools that are useful in, say, linear algebra and linear regression and a lot of the basic models. Um, and, and then they become your tools for analysis. So not any particular model, but the whole collection of tools. Right? Um, I think that's important, especially, you know, now with machine learning, you know, you're not going to get papers published in machine learning if you invent something close to a linear model. It's got to be an exotic model with lots of complexity. Um, and we feel it's really important to test those models against some of the simpler models that have been around for a long time. So I think for an applied statistician or data scientist, it's important to be comfortable and familiar with a, a wide variety of tools. And, you know, some tools, even though they, they you know, they're different from, the, the new tools that are invented are different. They stay around if they, they tend to, to bear up, you know. So for example, I think Random Forest, for example, is a very exotic black box, but it's stayed around because it's extremely useful. So just for example, one great use of a random forest is, even if you want a simpler model that's easier to explain and easier to present, a random forest is a wonderful benchmark to see if your model's up to snuff, right? If the random forest improves in performance by 30% over your favorite model, you've still got some work to do. Even though you don't plan to present the random forest as your final model, it's a good benchmark. Hi, Trevor. Uh, Pete Flach from Bristol. Thank you for the talk. Um, I heard you talk about tall data and wide data. I didn't hear you mention the D word, uh, deep models. What is your view on deep learning? Well, uh, I did, uh, you know, I had it in tiny print. <laughs> um, no, deep learning's made a big impact. Um, I think deep learning, particularly in image modeling and, and uh, speech modeling, and also handwrite. But let's just focus on image, uh, image modeling. So deep learning has, has really made a big breakthrough because uh, deep convolutional neural networks have been very successful in in modeling and representing images and doing good image classification. Unfortunately, they've become now the go-to model for every kind of data analysis, and people feel if they don't have deep learning somewhere in the abstract of their paper, you know, it's not gonna look snazzy enough. And I think that's wrong, you know. Um, you, you're bound to find papers, say in the medical journals, where deep learning's been used and it's completely inappropriate, right? And all you have to do is fit a linear model and find that it's got almost the same performance. So not for, every, not for everything, but there are places where deep learning is impressive, yeah. 
Um, John, John T. Rusha, University of Bristol. Um, these massive data sets have, uh, have lots of sparsity because they have lots of acknowledged zeros in, but they have lots of missingness as well. Now, standard machine learning methods seem to me that they treat the missingness as, as ignorable. Um, and yet we know um, from um, catastrophic failures, machine learning techniques, that missingness is usually not ignorable. Right. So how is it that they're working despite the fact they're making the wrong assumption for the missingness? Well, that's a good question. And uh, you, are, you know, models are all wrong anyway. You know, so they're wrong in other ways. So if they're wrong in the way they treat the missingness, they probably pain something for it, but they're still performing fairly well. But I agree, you know, missing, you know, missing data is often just treated as a headache, and especially with massive data, it's hard to do, you know, kinds of exotic imputation, and so it just gets ignored. People just do some kind of crude imputation and pretend it was never there, you know. There are, there are clever things you can do, you know, with extra time, but it's rarely done. Yeah. Trees, by the way, have, have got some nice features and ways of dealing with missing data using surrogate variables, and so they tend to overcome the so random forest and boosting methods if, if the missing values are treated appropriately, can actually deal with it better. Hi, I'm Mo Abulke from uh, the University of Bristol. Uh, when you presented uh, the statistical um, outcome for computer use over weekdays and weekends, you supplemented that with a causal explanation as parents do this and children do that. And I'm sort of intrigued as to whether you did that for the benefit of the audience or whether you sometimes do supplement statistical findings with causal inference. Yes, no. no that was I making a causal statement? No, well, I shouldn't have, right? This is observational data and uh, so it was an association that was seen, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's tempting, isn't it? <laughs> we do it all the time. <laughs> but you're perfectly correct. Yeah. Hi, Tom Dieter from Amazon. Um, so um, in the examples you gave, uh, there was certainly big in various different ways, but they, they seem to be uh, static in the sense that your data is there and you want to perform some analysis on it. So um, how do you feel about, you know, more and more uh, we have data that is constantly moving. Yeah. And so, you know, that poses problems in terms of how you actually do the computation, but also in, the, in terms of the types of models that you might choose. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. And uh, yeah, I think even years ago, um, a lot of models were fit by um, subsampling. Now, very popular is uh, stochastic gradient descent for training models such as deep learning models, you know, which subsample the data and use gradient descent and update the model. And, you know, if the data is changing, you can just continuously be doing that as the data is arriving. Um, so I know people do things like that, you know. It's not something I've had experience with. It. A good point. Thanks. Um, Liz Washbrook, University of Bristol. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you could say anything more about software. Um, so you're clearly a, a huge fan of R. Um, and so is that kind of all you would need if you were embarking on machine learning? Um, or do you think some of the other software has advantages? Oh, yeah. No, no. It's not all you need. It's all I need because I haven't learned any of the other things. Oh, I still know Fortran. <laughs> No, so there's, there's other language, there's other languages um, that, that people need um, and use, you know, so there's Python's very popular um, and Java and JavaScript and, um, you know, so, but I think Python's gaining popularity and competing with R. Um, and there'll be other database languages, you know, for just dealing with massive amounts of data. Um, but, you know, I'm, I've used R all my life, so that I tend to use R in things I do. And R is becoming increasingly versatile because it interfaces. There are interfaces. There's R Python. You can interface with Python. Um, there's, um, uh, let's see, um, 
there's a there are recent anyway, there's lots of nice interfaces. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what do you think the role of the applied data science is going forward as approaches become increasingly automated? So stuff like automated machine learning oh. algorithms are getting developed? You know, I think we got to um, so, so applied statisticians should engage with these new methods. Um, my experience is in the past is that there'll be exotic new methods that come out and uh, we'll sit back as statisticians and we say, oh, we did that kind of thing, you know, and you know, somehow they think they re reinvent, they reinvent in the wheel. But I think statisticians have a, a really important role in digging in deeper and trying to understand the new methodology, see where it fits in the framework of models we already know about, and also learning about the properties of these models. You know, and historically that's happened. You know, so models like random forests, boosting neural networks, a, a lot of the understanding about these models has been delivered by the, the applied statistics community. You know, so I think that's our role, that's part of our role going forward. And, you know, and also, you know, if we, you know, statisticians know a lot about different kinds of data and different, um, you know, sources of error models and things like that, whereas the machine learning community tends to, you know, have a much narrower focus. And, and what's really interesting is taking the new methodology and seeing how it can be adapted to, 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 to deal with these different kinds of, of data. Hi, uh, Alistair Nottle from Airbus. Uh, sort of a follow-on from that point then. Um, Data science is just about starting to cross that bridge from being something that's very much in the academic realm uh, to something that people are starting to play with and, and explore with themselves, um, particularly with the huge uh, boost in, in open source tools and things like that. People are effectively sitting in their bedrooms and rather than trying to hack Russian servers, are, are toying around uh, playing, with, playing with data science. Um, but uh, what I worry is that could create a problem then where people are uh, exploring and, and exploiting data science without necessarily understanding the fundamentals of it. Yeah. Uh, and we could end up in, in a situation where we have plenty of people who are data scientists, but what they are actually are experts at using tools with no real understanding. Um, so how do you think we can go about tackling that problem? No, I think, I think that's a really important point. And I mean, I've seen that already. You know, I mean, there's many ways you can do a little bit of training and call yourself a data scientist and not really know any of the tools very well. And that's dangerous. It's just as dangerous as it was um, 40 years ago when we had packages like SAS and BMDP and, and, you know, and as an applied statistician, I remember in my first job, there were these packages that could fit models. And so you just needed to know how to get your data in and it spat out stuff at you and I never knew what it was telling me really and uh, you know and so I think we're in a similar situation today they are all these tools and it's about plug and play and so I think it's really important in the statistics community to create courses and train you know data scientists in our own way to understand all the tools and to make sure they know what the important procedures are and then they'll know better how to put them together yeah. And then there was a question just in front. Yep, thanks. Uh, Graham from Mango Solutions. Um, so there are hundreds of different models, different types of algorithms. Do, do you have any practical advice on kind of how to get started, how to decide which ones to try? Well, um, often, you know, which ones to try, yeah. I mean, you know, what I'll usually do, I mean, if I've got a prediction problem, what you would like to do is something simple first, just to see where you are. And one thing I'll do is fit a random forest, and I'll fit GLMnet, GLMnet, right? One's a linear model, a series of linear models, and one's a very complex high-order interaction model. And I'll look at the performance on some left-out test data, and straight away, you'll get a good idea of how complex you need to be. You know, because you know, if, if, if the data is very noisy and doesn't support a rich model, random forest is going to do poorly, and, and the linear model is likely to do better. 
And then that's a good starting point. And, you know, and then you move on from there. Uh, but the basic idea is you try a few different approaches to, to find out where you need to concentrate. Any last questions? We've probably got time for one or two more. No? Well, I think I'm right in saying that, Trevor, you're going to be around at about 2.30? Yeah. Yeah? Huge vote of thanks for coming, oh. um, coming out of your way to, to come and talk to us today and allowing us to kind of welcome you to the city. I see faces in the audience here, now that I'm standing up here looking at you again, from every faculty in the university and from, from many organizations that we work with uh, within the city and, and the local region. So a really diverse audience, and it's, it's fantastic to see that. And I think that's testament to, to your draw. Oh, well, thank you <laughs> all audience. very much for coming. So, Mary, thank you once yeah. more.